Sharing Power in Client-Counselor Relationships with Sandra Collins and Gina Ko. Sandra, um, I am looking forward to our conversation today about um, talking to clients about power dynamics. Um, mm -hmm. And the reason why I am so looking forward to it is because often, more times than not, I, I do bring it up in, in, in sessions. Um, well, as all you all see and you all know, I'm a Chinese Canadian woman. You know, people who look at me, of course, can can either know right away or guess that um, I'm, I'm Asian. Um, may, maybe they can guess I'm Chinese as well. So, um, in my counseling practice now, I have a lot of Asian clients from different parts of the world, actually. So, so from Southeast Asia, um, mainly from Southeast Asia, actually. So, um, Vietnamese, Chinese, Korean, Filipino, um, Canadians. Um, <clears throat> and um, sometimes I, I sense or they tell me, you know, Gina, you're so educated, you know a lot, you know, I want advice, right? And, and for me, um, I, I, I continuously um, let them know I'm learning from you as well. I'm learning with you. Um, you know, when I do sessions in Cantonese, um, my clients, I tell my clients, I'm learning a lot of Cantonese from you. <laughs> Because these are not words I use every day, right? In my everyday life. Um, so, in terms of some of the examples, I would uh, point out: yes, in this area, I do have I do have some expertise, such as some anxiety resources, for example. And you are the one experiencing some anxiety um, symptoms, right? So you know yourself best in terms of what may be helpful and what may not be. So if I suggest something and um, if you don't, and you try it and you don't find it helpful, absolutely okay to let me know and, and I will ask, right? Um, so it's not about me being the expert. Gina said this, it must work. If it doesn't, then I've failed, right? So that's one example. Another example is um, some of my clients, uh, when I worked at Eastside, um, practiced there, some of them actually are homeless or living in low, low income housing and getting you know, some support from the government. I can sense, and sometimes they tell me there's some shame about that. You know, it's, the life has been really difficult and um, I, I am cognizant that they, it takes them courage, it takes courage and vulnerability to, to seek for counseling support. So I, I do commend them, I validate them. And I also ensure that um, yeah, I check in. Is, is the session still helpful? Are we talking about what you came to talk about? Again, not having the expert lens. Oh, you came because you you don't have a home. So you must be looking for a place to live. I, I don't know, don't, maybe, maybe they're not. Maybe they're, you know, sometimes they say they're couch surfing and then they're fine with that, right? So really explore what, what is really important in those moments. And when I catch myself assuming, um, I would pause, right? I would pause. And sometimes I use some transparency, actually. I would say something like, I, I, I think I'm making an assumption here, but I wanna check in with you. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm hearing. Is this, is this right? So those are some examples, Sandra. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the things picking up on what you said, Gina, um, that I have found helpful in talking with clients is also um, talking about the dynamic between us and how the ways in which we're positioned differently within society or within our communities can sometimes um, come into the assumptions that we each bring to the counseling process. And so it's useful for us to be able to talk about that. So what's it like to actually, um, like you said, be um, between homes or um, what's it like to be in a situation where you're experiencing discrimination within the community um, which may not be experiences that I've had and so there are times when I can provide some self-disclosure about my own experience as a lesbian or as a person with a disability to um, equalize power in some way and to share um, the commonalities. So what are the themes that kind of emerge from that? And there are other times where it's just important to be able to say that that's not an experience that I've had. And so it's really important um, to create space for the client to be able to share what's that experience like and how does that impact how you see yourself and how you interact with other people and mm -hmm. um, to 
from the perspective in this chapter to also capture the strengths in that um, and to look at the ways in which clients have responded actively to the challenges that they've been confronted with and the ways that they have um, found their own sense of self-efficacy and agency, which is about um, validating the power that they do have in their lives and um, bringing that to the foreground. So those are some of the things that I have found helpful in terms of talking with clients about power and, and beginning to talk about power dynamics between myself and clients in the counseling session. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Sandra. <clears throat> when you talk, when you mentioned self-disclosure, um, it made me think of, um, of course, when we talk about self-disclosure, it's, it's about the client, it's not about the counselor, right? Um, I often, yeah, kind of often have times when I feel like, oh, I actually have these similar experiences as my client growing up. So for example, I, I lived in a few government housing complexes and, and, and townhomes because my raised by a single mom, you know, she had part-time work. And um, so when my client in front of me tells me, oh, we are living under the poverty line, we struggle, I have to be cognizant that if I were to do a self-disclosure, for example, about my childhood experiences, number one, it's, it's about the client. Mm -hmm. Number two, again, what is the purpose of, of, of disclosing that? And think that through. And number three, to not assume that my childhood experiences of living in government housing is just like my client's experiences right now, mm -hmm. right? So that's something that um, would be important in terms of power and privilege because um, as, a, as a therapist, as a counselor, uh, it's, it's, it's a, a, we all know self-awareness, self-reflexivity is important. So when I start to assume, I need to check it, my assumptions and going back to what I said earlier to sometimes use transparency about I, I may be making an assumption, an assumption, but I want to check in with you. Um, I'm using a lot more transparency now, uh, and that, that helps with um, equalizing, you know, the, the power dynamics. Absolutely. And I think that one of the things that I have heard new counselors struggle with is um, being able to come to counseling from a place of recognizing their privilege and not getting into apologizing for it or justifying it in some way in a conversation about power it's it's really not about that it's about naming mm. it's about naming power differences it's about naming what happens in society around um, what is valued and what is not valued and it's about i think um, being able to keep foregrounding what is important like you said for the client. So um, otherwise, I think that's another way in which we make um, stuff about us in a session. So if we come in feeling guilty because we are white or we are a person of privilege and we haven't actually um, really wrestled with what that means in terms of our positioning in society and moved past that place of guilt to um, responsibility mm -hmm. and um, taking an active position in naming and dismantling and challenging power dynamics in society and inviting our clients into that then i think that we're we're still bringing ourselves in and being counselor focused instead of client focused mm -hmm. and as you as you talk about naming and not apologizing for some reason i'm thinking about sympathy versus empathy mm -hmm. so apologizing and maybe carrying that guilt it might it might lean towards sympathy like this person in front of me i, I need to apologize for my privilege whereas naming and um what well, well, naming it's it's more empathy right like i am I, i'm uh, bringing this to the fore to name it and sitting with the client and being with the client um, so yeah, it made me think of that. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a really good um, parallel to what I'm trying to talk about here. And I think it, um, it just reinforces that um, our position is about um, compassion and about invitation and about transparency, um, like you said. And it's about two human beings coming together who are 
always going to have power dynamics between them and those power dynamics might shift you know there will be times where like you said where you'll have something to contribute to the conversation that does come from your um, education and your research and some of those things and other times where um, the client will have things to contribute to the conversation that will be new learning for you new learning for me and so it's it's acknowledging that in a way that is honest and legitimate um, and genuine as opposed to sort of token conversations about power where I think um, you know we're, we work with lots of really smart people they see through um, conversations where we're trying to um, minimize power dynamics as opposed to naming them, bringing them forward and navigating a shared power, um, a shared collaborative process with clients. Mm -hmm. 